Today is July 22nd. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Neganago, Mekoche, Che Stokom Aki, or De Goats, Negotine, Siku. Hi, my name is Red Thunder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed US Canadian border are the Blackfeet, north of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lines are Treaty 7, signed September 22nd, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Wesley, Chiniki, and Bearspaw Nations of the Stony Nations, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nations, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands signing on your behalf. Um, it is really important to understand outside of engendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role. It's important that land acknowledgements have meaning. I encourage all to introduce themselves with their acknowledgement of their ancestors, stories of displacement, how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, or any other land displacement, so we as Indigenous peoples know how safe you are to be around. If you don't know how to pronounce your local Indigenous nations of origin, won't acknowledge stolen lands, won't acknowledge imposed economic oppression, or your role in reconciliation, I determine how safe you are to be around for my community, my family, and myself. Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101, because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppressed and, uh, oppression dynamics, broken treaties and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally, and then of course perpetuated through media. That's why settlers and those who call themselves so-called native Calgarians show me you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear Lake tribe in Treaty 11. My people were rabbit skin, so we've been referred to the land of the hair people. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Pincho Tine Indehe in Satu Dene, meaning big, many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary, or in Blackfoot, Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, another English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene, or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the Canadian government says Yellowknife Dene. Through my father, I am a daughter of the American Revolution and a daughter of the Mayflower, while having an Indian Act and Post status card. That is a colonial construct by Canadian policy meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights. Indigenous two-spirit or the Indigenous um, two-spirit, lesbian, bisexual, um, gay, transgender, queer community, and Indigenous women are at the bottom of the socio-economic ladder in Canada because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. As a Dene woman who has attempted to run after joining harmful colonial parties, spent money to be at expensive conventions, left my home to travel to conventions just to vote on incomplete policies that still allow incarceration, a denial of justice, denial of health services, racism, colonial trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have work to do, reports to advocate for, and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I cannot say, you know, have a great long weekend, knowing my community is dying from the current drug policies and imposed Christian-based drug systems of abstinence programming, private health care, and justice systems based on racism, land theft, and imposed British constructs that continue genocide on Indigenous people. My hope is that you will see your role in the importance of stopping harm as a citizen and see your role in reconciliation. My hope is that we honor the lives of those who are past and are surviving today. I honor the Blackfoot elders. They have been kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Blackfoot. Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretation on the entire podcast is on me. I encourage questions so that misunderstanding of all Indigenous. I just share my journey as I walk the red road. I have been accused of not being kind while surviving genocide. Yet, I have given free book, club, book clubs, podcasts, and info on my social media for years, as have many others. 
at this point, it is willful to be ignorant. Calgarian, where you can pledge. If you value listening, watching, if you can afford to give, thank you. Be at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. Also, giving a review helps whatever medium you're listening from. I also have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe. You can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. Uh, we just celebrated our 200th episode, so maybe your um, review could include what was your favorite episode or something that resonated to you or whatever you'd like to do. At any rate, I have a way. Hi, um, my name is Brad Gallant. Um, I'm a member of the Hollipoo Micmac Band. Um, and in murky cir circumstances, uh, as my mom was a member and all my dad's siblings, surviving siblings were members, I'm a 6'2". Um, it was a very interesting deal that was forced upon them. I think the guys got, got uh, taken advantage of, but that's beyond the point. Um, I'm white appearing, of course, and I have the choice of um, avoiding racism, which most indigenous don't because I don't appear indigenous. My brother does. Most people in my family do. But the luck of the genetic pool comes out, and I, you know, I have blue eyes. And if I had brown eyes, and I put on rocker wigs before, and, and you, you, the, the face shape kind of gives it away that I'm, a, I'm indigenous. Um, but that being said, it's a different thing when you can walk away from racism. Um, most people don't, indigenous people don't have that choice. Um, and I choose not to walk away from it. And I don't deny the fact that I'm indigenous. And I don't think that being indigenous is makes you lesser. Um, but on mascots, it's uh, which I did a lot of activism on. I, I think it's just the indication that Canada just doesn't see indigenous people as people. Um, like the BLM moment in the NHL was pretty disgusting because they did it with the Chicago Blackhawks. And Ethan Bear had to sit by and watch. Now, there were three, uh, Matt Dumba, who was, I believe, a Asian Canadian. Um, he got the King Clancy. Malcolm Saban and Daryl Nurse got contracts. And at the end of the playoffs the next year, Ethan Bear was harassed and traded when he, when he stood up for himself. Um, it's just people don't acknowledge it. Like the Hockey Diversity Alliance doesn't include Indigenous people. When all the um, all the initiatives to ban hate speech in hockey started with the abuse of Ted Nolan in 2005. And in the Quebec Hockey League, where they started saying that you couldn't use slurs on the ice because he was taunted so bad. And it's like people just don't realize. Like there was a guy... Uh, who was harassed a couple of years ago in Quebec, uh, Jean-Paul Vero or Jean-Francois Vero, Vero Paul. Um, I'm forgetting his name now, but he had to go to, he's an indigenous guy who had to play for the Red at McGill. And then in 2019, he's playing senior hockey in Quebec and he gets taunted by the Sorrel Tracy Blackhawks and he leaves the game. And like, you understand what happens in hockey. You see what happens to um, to Devontae Pelly smith at the Blackhawks game where they talked about the racism against Devontae Pelly smith and nothing about the Blackhawks logo. Uh, or with Wayne Simmons when he was taunted in, in, um, in London during a preseason game in, I think, 12 or 10 or 12. But, I mean, it's not like Kerry Price going into um, – Chicago Stadium with guys wearing red face and there's a mascot on the other jersey and it's just like people just don't see it they don't admit it that that's a disconnect and and in that I guess you could say invisibility to indigenous issues is the basis of indigenous problems in Canada because if you don't think you're hurting human beings then you don't think it's wrong what you're doing and um I never thought Canada was racist when I started this. And I see no difference between Canada and the U.S. And statistically, um, it's worse for Indigenous people here in Canada than Black people in the U.S. Um, 
And you, you look at some of the issues, it's like Jackie Robinson didn't have to go into the Uncle Ben's and play hot and play baseball. And <laughs> that was the 1930s. I mean, it's just like this stuff shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't have Indigenous Peoples Day and do all the acknowledgements this year and then feature the cataracts, the Shawinigan cataracts and the Memorial Cup on T TSN that night mm -hmm. on, that, on a national broadcast. Yeah. And so what's going on with Hockey Canada is just like, yeah, yeah, we've seen you on abuse before, guys. You only do it when your hands are completely forced. Yeah. And Trudeau doesn't mention it. They all talk about it, all of it, the abuse in hockey and how terrible it is. And but they just ignore the Blackhawks, they ignore the cataracts, they ignore the all the teams. And it's just um can you tell folks who may not know what the cataracts are? The cataracts are a major junior team that's in Quebec and she went again, which is a little east of Montreal. And they use a big Indian head logo as uh, as their logo. But cataract um, is a waterfall because the senior team at home with Grand Falls cataract in Newfoundland, where I'm from, uh, that was named after the waterfalls. That's what a cataract is. And for some reason, the shoe again uses an Indian head logo. And um, it's just uh, the fact that this still goes on in Hockey Canada. And it, see, the, the ignorance and the a disregard for Indigenous that comes, that is learned through sports right from the cradle in Canada and the US. Yeah. I mean, that comes out to the, the ignoring of women when a woman's missing to MMIW, to the consequences of residential schools. I mean, this is the racism that's taught. And unless you address this racism, then the cycle of racism that continues in Canada is just gonna change. I mean, uh, reserves or scalping bounties are gonna come become reserves, which became residential schools, which is now forced foster care. The tactics have changed, but the outcome is still the same. Yeah. And until you change the underlying racism, the underlying assumption that you can do what you want to Indigenous people, then these things are going to continue. And land acknowledgements, I think they're they're nice, but they're tokens. No, 100%. Hey, got, like, honestly, but, Brad, the biggest reason why I, I stress them is because there is no acknowledgement of Indigenous people existing at all. And, and for here, especially in a so-called time of reconciliation, like the truth is the majority of Canadians can't say anything Indigenous. Uh, yep. Bugani, for example, that is that one is regularly said wrong here in our territory. And, and, and that, you know, like, it, how can you even pretend you care about reconciliation? Like it, there's such a disconnect on Canadians like history that they can't even start there. They can't even begin there. I think the expectation of what equality is for Indigenous people is just not there. Yeah. Like agree. you call yourself red, you call yourself red thunder woman. That's not your name. That's not your no. Blackfoot name. Call yourself your Blackfoot name. It's your language. It's fine. If I can learn how to pronounce um, the Sikh guys and I'm the Islamic guys, and I can learn their names. And, and the, the most difficult names I find are the, the guys from Sri Lanka. Or, and if I can pronounce their names because it's just a sign of respect, then I should be learn via, be able to pronounce someone's name in Cree. Mm -hmm. And it should be, it's like, like 50 years ago when a Chinese person came to Canada, or even 20 years ago. If their name was Shin, they called them a girl would call themselves Sydney. And now they call themselves by their real name. And the expectation is this is my name. Please address me with decency. Yeah. Um, and indigenous people just like, okay, hey, this is my name. Learn how to pronounce it. Yeah. Like, so what happened after I did the mascots? There was still a ban. Second, there was still a banner in one of the stadiums in Toronto. And I started coaching my daughter's team and I'm going to a new stadium and I have to pass the Humber Valley Braves banner. Say that one more time. And I had to pass the Humber Valley's Braves banner, the old logo of the team, to get to the bench. Now they had changed this, I don't know, at least 15, 20 years ago. But what happened is I emailed the guy who ran the house league and he emailed the city and it was changed in a week. That 
is the expectation that you should have. Yeah. It's like when those kids got abused in Quebec at that Bantam hockey co- tournament, the First Nations elites, the Micmacs from Nova Scotia, yeah. the coach was saying that, get used to it. This is what it's going to be the rest of your life. And I'm like, no, fuck that. Yeah. Because it's the only word. It's just like, fuck that. No, the expectation has to change. Yep. You get to exist and to go into your school and to expect the same treatment as anyone else. Yeah. Because right now it's don't make fun of Johnny, don't make fun of Joni, and fuck the indigenous kid. Yeah. And that's the way it is. I mean, that's why when your teachers, like when they did the, uh, when those kids got killed on the bus out in uh, Humboldt, right? Yeah. And they did Humboldt Day. So there were a number of teachers posted in their, uh, all the school boards posted their Humboldt Day jerseys, and half of them were, were Blackhawks. And it's just like, or Chiefs, or whatever else they wore in the school. And it's just like, if your kid is wearing this and your teacher is going to give you, a, you're an indigenous kid and you want to be treated as equal and the teacher gives a high five to a kid in a Blackhawks or a Redskins jersey, then it's pretty clear where you're ranking as a, in society. Yep. Um, in the human rights uh, col- policies and guidelines of Ontario, they say Canada, and this is uh, oft repeated lie, Canada is a country founded on colonization and immigration. So colonists first. Immigration next. And that's wrong. Canada is a country founded upon indigenous people mm-hmm. for the benefit of colonization and to profit from immigration. And so if your Human Rights Commission defines itself as excluding indigenous, yep. then you can see why I go through six times and I went through six different cases in the Human Rights Commission and lost them all or settled and the settlements weren't honored. And so it's just like there, so it's a system, it's systemic injustice. And that's the name of the documentary that I, that I have. And it won um, best native American film. Congratulations. (laughs) That's great. And that was a big part of the reason why I wanted to have you on here today, because I just, yeah, I think people, sorry, don't be sorry. It's fine. Uh, That bigger picture of, you know, um, I grew up in Sylvan Lake, Alberta, which is right beside Red Deer. And yeah. the Sutters had a, you know, had a house in Sylvan Lake. And everybody yeah. talked about them and, and um, Don McLean being from Red Deer. And so Red Deer is yeah. this huge hub for hockey. And yeah, my well, people, the Satu Denny, actually, we were the ones who invented hockey. And so it's been appropriated by non-Indigenous people, made to be, made all this money and we don't benefit from it at all and worse we get we become caricatures in their um mascotting yeah well the look the nhl does all this stuff on diversity right they did the blm moment with with the blackhawks but after akim alu you heard the member uh who was it bill peters who was the coach of the calgary flames bill peters got fired because he was racist to akim alu and they did a big panel on diversity uh, on Hockey Night in Canada, and they did it on Hometown Hockey the next night. Hometown Hockey was in right there. And they ended the broadcast with two kids, minor hockey kids, and one of them was a girl in a Red Deer Sutter Chiefs jersey. Here they were talking about the importance of diversity and inclusion in hockey, and they end the friggin' broadcast with the Red Deer Sutter Chiefs. Now the Sutters, from what I understand, are Swiss. They're not indigenous. And why is the face of a Sutter in a logo called the Red Deer Sutter Chiefs and an Indian's head? And why is he a coach in the NHL when Bill Peters just says the N word a couple of times that now it's wrong, shouldn't have been done. But if he does that once to Akim Alou and he gets fired, but here is um, Dal Sutter uses it for his charity. And I've tweeted it to Kelly Verdi. Kelly Verdi followed me on Twitter. A couple other guys. It's like, what? Say something. Have some balls. Say right. something. Right. This is wrong. And no one will say anything. And they get on and they talk about their bullshit about this. And they're crying about this. And they're, they're uh, all this stuff. And diversity. And they talk about Kyle Beach on the Blackhawks. And they get on and they cry. And the culture of silence and hockey towards abuse. And then they don't say a goddamn thing about the Blackhawks. And it's just like, because the money is involved with the Blackhawks. 
Yep. And the money trumps rights. Yep. Because if you want rights, you don't have rights unless you've got cash. Because Canada can say what it wants about all of this good intentions and all that stuff. Because if you don't have money, you don't have rights. And if you have money, you can acquire rights from others. That's why they can pay a fool from uh, some tribe, from Sac and Fox or Six Station, and get them on and say, we like the Blackhawks. And then every other the 6 million Indigenous people have to put up with it because <coughs> they've paid off one or two guys. Yeah. Or they pay off some idiot from the Eastern Cherokee and he, everyone has to put up with Braves, right? And so, and then they put it on Sportsnet and they put it on TSN and they say, diversity, 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 diversity. Oh my God, we want to include Indigenous people. And now it's the Blackhawks game. Let's do the Tomahawk job with the Chiefs. And it's like, people don't know. You call a chief, uh, uh, an indigenous person chief, or a man, go out and call him chief. You're doing the same thing as calling a black person boy. Yep. And not boy, but boy. Boy. Like the, the Alabama, I mean, it's meant to be an insult. It's yeah. a racist connotation. It's a social contract. I can do to you whatever I want, is what that word says, and you don't have any rights. Yeah. And then to see it on national TV in the NFL all the time, or to have to pay off the Florida Seminole, and then the guys, the Oklahoma Seminole, Seminole who don't like the, sem the use of the word Seminole, and they have to put up with it. I mean, that's perverse. If you look at what, uh, when the, the Mark Meadows brought in the one black woman during the Michael Cohen hearings in the US, in the, uh, in the House of Representatives, it <coughs> and he said, well, Donald Trump can't be racist because he has his black woman who works for him. And Rashida Tlaib got up and was like, what are you doing? He's like, to think that he would just use one person as a token to prove that it's okay is fine is racist in itself. But yet that's what they're doing on national TV in Canada every single fucking day. Every day. And it's just like, it's just like, yeah. So, so after we settled with Mississippi, with Mississauga, so Don Cherry, during the middle of the trial, was on Coach's Corner, wore the Chiefs jersey first time. That idiot, Kevin Jackal Johnson, called me up three or four times the next week. And you know him out in Calgary. He started at Mississauga. When they heard about my case, they had the Mississauga Tomahawks, which had the two Tomahawks like that. And then he changed the logo to a Tomahawk, made it more racist. And they did a big story in the Toronto Star with Mississauga News, the local Toronto Star. And so... Cherry gets on CBC. Um, this idiot calls me three or four times, tries to get me on this freedom report. And um, the people, some people at the state at, at Kate's game started wearing their, their black hot gear around. And it's just like, it's great. And I was banned from speaking because I was like, oh, the judge said, because I got on the news once and said, it was nice to hear someone else agree with me. I wasn't allowed to speak. So I had, here's this idiot on national TV making fun of me. And I had to sit there and take it. That's fair enough. And so after we settled, uh, they had hometown hockey in Mississauga. The kids weren't allowed to wear their Chiefs and their Ojibwe and their Blackhawks and their Braves jerseys to, to the Celebration Square. So they have Hazel McCallion on with Don Cherry and Tara Sullivan and Rob McLean. And then they show a picture of Hazel's contribution to hockey. And she comes out in a Chiefs jersey. Because all of this is just like, yeah, you think you won. I can do to you whatever I want. And don't you think that you're equal to me? I can put you in your place anytime you want. And that's all it is. And I, you and know what? So, this is so important, though, is that I try to tell Canadians, under the Indian Act, we are still wards of the state, and we still don't have our governance. So, like, it, 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 there's an oppression dynamic that Canadians don't understand. And you get these... A stupid yeah. idiots like Don Cherry that don't understand any of this. And then, like you said, just perpetuate racism and remind you, you are under, under us. Like that, that is white supremacy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's what mascots are. They're cradles of racism. Yeah. So I have the one image where I do a cradles of racism and I shared it with the Chicago Tribune. And the next week, Chicago Tribune, uh, the Blackhawks band mascot wear at games. I don't know if it was the only reason, but it, with the timing was nice. Um, so, but yet they're like, they're, I got pictures of the black mayor from Kansas City and 
they uh, in Canada, my black friends say, call us black, we're not African Canadians. So I use that, not a disrespect if you prefer African American. It's just that that's why the way I'm trained. So they will have all these pictures of the black mirror and 40 of his uh, friends of the same race, pictures of the chiefs. And see, the problem is the treatment through mascots are the lowest bar of treatment in humanity in North America. This is the worst possible treatment that anyone has to put up with. To be mocked constantly on national TV, to be told to take, take a pill, or even as the, the CBC gets some minister from none of it on the Eskimos and said, take a Valium, say it's not important, the concerns are nothing. And so if you let them do this, then sooner or later, they're going to do it to Jewish people, or they're going to do it to Black people, or they're going to do it to Asian people. And it's just like this belief that they can treat people who are different than them any way they want, yeah. just has to go away. And so so the, the movie just goes over this. This is what I call a pyramid of racism. So you have white supremacy and the doctrine of discovery and some cornerstones. Yes. And the mascots perpetuate and crescendo of racism. Yes. And the things of MMIW and residential schools and the healthcare and the education, they are symptoms of the, of the culture of racism. Yes. And until you address the culture of racism, until you uh, get get it out and say that hey you got to stop the mascots just stop treating, thinking you can treat people as less get rid of them and start admitting it's like Canada is pretty messed up I mean you couldn't use your red thunder woman your the black fort version of that you couldn't use that on your passport until last year yeah. and even still when people have tried this year to use their indigenous name on the passports that's been refused yeah. and that's like if you watch Henry Louis Gates Finding Your Roots and they had uh, Anita Hill on and they'd show them that they list their slaves and they'd never give their names. And they'd give the, never give their names on the census. They'd just say black male 18. And they do that as a measure of control to destroy their identity, to make sure that they understood that they were less. So that was, and that stopped in the 61 census. Okay, pre-Civil War. And so Canadians, Indigenous, weren't allowed to use their names until 2021. And even then it's refused. And they say they stopped the birth alerts, which is perverse. You know, as soon as an Indigenous woman gets pregnant, they call social services on the assumption that she doesn't have the wherewithal or the ability to care for a child. The embedded racism in that is just so profound. It's not mm -hmm. funny. And then they only stop that in name last year and there's still a couple of provinces that do it and they still do it in the provinces they say they don't they, because it's sound sterilization technically yeah. they don't do it but they do it all the time coerced sterilization yeah yeah and and they say the stuff that went on in the states and they talk about it like it's a past thing and they did do it to black people and they did do it uh in the as far as the 40s i think the sterilization in the 50s and they did the the experiments on the syphilis in georgia in the 1940s but they're doing the stuff in canada much later oh yeah like now like right yeah. now and it's just like it's continuing and we won't acknowledge it and and so what my documentary is trying to do is like look this is all the stuff that's going on here. Do you realize what the country is doing? Yeah. And is this a country you can be proud of? Because I made a choice. You can either live in a country where you keep your mouth shut, you keep your head down, and they tell you you belong and you believe them. Or you can you say what you want and say what you want for your country, and you acknowledge what's going on because you either stand up for it. Because I don't think Canadians want to live in a crappy place that we're living in. I don't think they want to live in a place that's so fundamentally racist. I don't think they want to have a court system where 42% of the women in prison are indigenous when they're only 6% of the population or 52% of the kids who are in healthcare or in foster care are indigenous when they're only 7% of the population. So those are the things that most people aren't aware of. And I think people have to learn. And it's just like, because what you don't realize, it's like, so the mascots, are scientific racist. Uh, so it's a distortion of a, an indigenous person's skull. So the Black Ox is the mirror image of, of uh, uh, the Redskins old logo. And they're just, that's just Uncle Ben's on a jersey. 
But when you allow these scientifically racist white supremacist images to persist, you will allow those thoughts and ideas to persist in mainstream culture. And they will keep coming back. There's Trump in 16, and there might be someone else in 32. So you gotta, you got to get it out from where it festers because you don't want this idiocy to prevail and persist and be, be around. The mascots perpetuate this idiocy of white supremacy. Yeah. And it's just, if you want to strike it out, you've got to look at what's the worst thing. You've got to take out your low-hanging fruit. And so, I mean, it's, and the culture is so perverse. After I signed a deal with my daughter's school board, where my wife works, um, they did an honor of the deal. So I held her out in 2018 for uh, three of the 10 games. And I said, honor the deal. So they honored the deal, even though they're supposed to honor it right away. So uh, she played, kids ignored her, just, you know, completely ignored her. Um, and so the next year we went back, I go to a game, supposed to be the best two teams. And the teacher uh, from the local school takes the kid's chief bag off the bus. And so because I've been to the human rights and the human rights did nothing, I went to the College of Teachers because there's a safe and accepting school. So it's like the teacher did this, they're wearing their gear during the game, didn't take a picture because they're minors and you can't take pictures of minors, right? But they admitted they did it and all that stuff. But the College of Teachers said, yes, there was a side deal stuck to the, struck to the human rights of someone. I got a funny feeling who, and it was an indigenous person struck a side deal that they had three years to get rid of the logos that they were supposed to get rid of right away. And when you're looking at it, it's like a, who thinks they're so important that they can strike a side deal? So that's indigenous people doing that. Who thinks they can speak for people and say that others have to put up with abuse? Because Stacey the Forum or the ladies of Six Nations, they can like the mascots. I'm not saying that they can't like the mascots. If you like the Black Ops logo and for some reason you find pride in that, that's great. But in the larger, larger uh, society, those images promote a hostile environment for other indigenous. And you can't approve the hostile environment for those other people. I'm not taking away their rights. I'm not telling them what they can like which a lot of them use their argument to say they can speak over me. I'm more native than him. So he has to shut up and you get to listen to me, which is what a lot of people have done. But the thing is, I can't say, I can't approve abuse for anyone else. All I can say is that this meets the standard for abuse. I don't want to see it when I go into an arena and someone else says, yeah, we disagree with Brad. And even though it meets every single standard of what ought to be known as uh, reasonably known as unwelcome, he has to put up with it because that's what people did. And I would tell you, after they settled and Six Nations, uh, or no, um, there are four groups and three or four groups were led by people who spoke in favor of mascots. The Human Rights Con Commission side nod to third parties approving what I was allowed to find as uh, unwelcome. Um, APTN held the first Cree, Cree game on, uh, on TV that March with the Blackhawks. So APTN. I know. So what the, what the fuck are APTN doing? That's I like bet, bet TV showing Birth of a Nation and saying, hey guys, these Birth of a Nation guys, that was a great American movie. And Bet would be like, what are you doing? It's like, we would never do this. So who are these guys who are partnering with the Blackhawks? Because the, the Blackhawks logo is used by 50 teams across the, across the uh, country, uh, you know? And it was used by the Morton Redskins. It was used by Lakefield Chiefs. It was used by, I believe there's three or four in Al Alberta that I got listed in a slide. And these, these teams cause problems for the indigenous in these communities. And one is APTN as the spokesman for indigenous and the protector of rights and the preservation. <laughs> but you know, that's why I do what I do because they're yeah. funded by the very people perpetuating the racism. 
So if right. they don't like do that, same with the CBC Indigenous, you know, like, like that, they're publicly funded. Well, they got Kenna, uh, Jessica there. I can't pronounce her, her Kenna, Kenna Hero, and I don't know if it's worse not to pronounce it or to mispronounce sure. it. Sure. But she did a story on racism in hockey for which she won an award, and she featured a guy in a Blackhawks hat. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you normalizing this treatment for other Indigenous? And you can't do that. It's like, I'm not saying that she can't personally like that logo. And, but the logo, the, the 86th division was named for the, uh, for the people of the uh, Wisconsin, Illinois Eater, Eater, for their prowess in the battles with their Indians. Slightly mentioned, so this name for the 86th division. So it's named for the colonialism, for their defeat of the Indians. And these guys are believing the story that it was named for Blackhawk, which is horseshit. Because, look, the Blackhawk logo is the Buffalo Nickel. And in my documentary, I take the picture of uh, Chief Iron Tail, I believe it's Chief Iron Tail, who is the model for the Buffalo Nickel, and I superimpose it with the Buffalo Nickel. And his nose is out a good bit, and his lips are big. So they've done the scientific racist treatment of this person, and they distorted his features. And then that becomes the Buffalo Nickel, which became the Redskins and the Blackhawks logo. And over time, the Blackhawks logo became like a human and slowly became the Buffalo Nickel. And it's a distortion. It's just Uncle Ben's. And I'm trying to let Black people and BIPOC people see that, hey, this is the same shit that they've done to you. Mm -hmm. And you're allowing it and you're perpetuating because if you let them do it to us, they're going to do it to you. And so it's the same guys who are watching by and standing by watching George Floyd uh, or who's the, I can't remember the crap, the piece of crap who stood on his neck. Yeah. Who's watching him. I know. <clears throat> I had COVID two weeks ago. <laughs> COVID. Are the same guys who are doing this on TV. It's just like they're just standing by and they're watching racism and they're doing nothing about it. And it's just like, it's hard. I'll give you an example that has always bothered me the most. There was yeah. this beautiful Anuk. Her name was uh, Kelly Frazier. And she, mm -hmm. she was a song. She, she, she sang. And everybody thought she was like super cool. But she, she had a lot of lateral violence. And uh, because she was a knock, she called out the Edmonton Eskimos for their logo and their name. And mm -hmm. um, it, even my people who are just south of the tree line were like, oh, we just love the Eskimos. It's such a great representation. She committed suicide. She's gone. Uh, Willie, oh, Willie, the little child. Live, one of the last things that she shared was um, a petition to change the Edmonton Eskimos name. And I, I've always wondered how any single Dene, any single anybody could even live with themselves knowing that they were perpetuating uh, that internalized racism onto an, a young, one of our young sisters, and now she's gone. And I, I'll yeah. never, never forgive people for that. That, that, that it's un, inexcusable and, and I, I will never understand. Thank God they changed their name to Elks or Eagles or whatever they changed their name to. I don't really care. But the point is, it's, it's, it's systemic racism, it's ongoing, it's generational, and, and everything that you've said up to this moment. So I just, I, I want you to know how much I support what you're doing. There's um, the Sports Calls to Action and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, as solutions. And, you know, it, I, I don't know how to tell people they need to be calling this out in their own sports club. Like at every single podcast, they say you need to be doing this work in your sports clubs, etc. I've yet to have a single person, despite what my numbers say people listen to, I have yet to have a single person say, oh my God, I didn't know that my, you know, six-year-old's uh, baseball club was, was being racist by doing this and have talked to the management and done something. Zero understanding by Canadians, their involvement in just looking the other way at this racism. I don't think there's zero understanding. I think it's just convenient to ignore yeah. Um, so the, you talk about the truth and reconciliation. After the truth and reconciliation report in 2018, 
Willie the little child went out and did a day with the Eskimos in his full headdress. And he's too smart to do that. He's like, he's who is the grand chief for uh, Treaty 6. He's a smart dude. He has experience in hockey and in racism. Uh, he was an athlete. He knows what it's like. And here he is just saying it's okay for the, for the people who are not him. Yeah. And we can't, we can't let that go anymore. No. Like I just, so, so during the trial, somebody told me at the gym that the Mississauga Golf and Country Club, Mississauga, this is the way it's written, used the most unfortunate logo possible. You ever seen it? No. I posted it on Twitter. So I, I got it here. Just give me a second. And I mean, so this is the rich, where the rich guys live in Mississauga. And this is on stolen probably, land. Uh, actually, it was the original credit mission uh, run by Ryerson, the original residential school. <laughs> okay. And they kicked them off and then they made it the golf and country club. Uh, I believe the lady who wrote for about uh, this one, Clarkson, who wrote about it in the Mississauga history. Um, they took over the land in the 1850s and they no longer reeks of the stench of the offals and the, and the litter, which littered the, and the, the fish offals and litter, which are garbage that littered the land they used. And she's got a station named after. Them. So oh, this was the, this is the Mississauga Golf and Country Club logo. They changed it in 2018. And someone, Stacy LaForme, who was with the Mississauga, who you know was fine with mascots, because I can't speak to this logo because this is not the Mississauga. I'm not Mississauga, right? I'm not a member of this band. I send it to Stacy. Stacy worked with them, and he got rid of it for his band. Right? It wasn't appropriate for him, but other logos are appropriate for everyone else, oh. and so. And so you'd see that, and these are the people who are on the, um, who are the major decision makers at the banks, right? This is the richest part of Mississauga, it's right, right down by the lakeshore. It's at the bottom of Mississauga Road and QEW. It's a fancy golf club. And so this was the logo they used in 2018, and they have a totem pole there in concrete. It's like, why? <laughs> Why do they have a total pole? I'm, uh, I'm in, you know, a hot in a Sony land with who don't use totem poles. I mean, it's just the guys in BC did it. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just funny. And they, they still had the logos up around the thing, their 100th anniversary from uh, 2006. And they have these posters up with that logo. And it's just like, these are the people who are saying no to me when I go and say mascots are bad. And these are the people who use it at their golf club. Oh my and God. apparently after they changed it, it was still on their name tags. Gross. So, so this is the chief hardtail. Yeah. You see the Buffalo nickel yep. and you see the orange there. Yep. So this is how they distorted his face. So that's the scientific racism. And I shared that with a professor who works with Henry Louis Gates at Penn State, Nina Jablonski, she does some camps with him. And she was the leader. Uh, she's a Nina Jablonski, obviously a white lady, but she she's an expert in the field of race studies and anthropology. And she said, yeah, I, I never realized how strong scientific racism was in the mascot. Now, other people might have had the thought before, but I shared that in the Huffington Post and I wrote a little article about it. And so I just put the pictures and said, look, this is scientific race. Um, and so that's just part of the culture. But another thing that when you say people are not aware, I just think it's too painful for them to acknowledge. As I explained to you earlier, I'm a math guy. I did an MBA in finance. I used to work on Wall Street. So I look at things from a different perspective than most people. And when we were talking about, um, I was writing to the first human rights case I did, uh, I complained about um, the Redskins being on TV with an offensive language warning. An offensive language warning is key because that cuts out 80% of the sponsors on TV. Yeah. So after the Harjo case where Redskins was declared a slur by the courts in the US, I said, well, since this is a slur, when this comes on Canadian uh, TV, it should have an offensive language warning. 
And so I wrote and I complained to the CBSC and the head of the CBSC wrote me back, this lady, Andrea Noel. And she said, no, in this context, it should be fine because presumably Redskins evoke positive images of First Nations people. No. I just take that shit into a sexual harassment. Yeah, I said something about her, her bosoms, but bosoms are very, very, very positive for women. So she should understand the compliment. And it's just, it's a farce. And yet here she is saying that's the reason why Redskins were okay. So when I appeal and I lost, of course, in a, some, you know, a pseudo evil um, jurisdictional issue. Um, so I was looking at, I'm trying to explain to people why it was bad. And I did a constant annual growth rate of the effect of genocides had on populations. So I took four, like most people don't, don't know about the Belgian Congo. They killed half the population of the Congo in 20 years, uh, just before the First World War. And so what they're trying to do is to eliminate these people. Like a virus, like, like the um, COVID vaccine, they're trying to make sure that most people didn't survive. So, but due to population growth in Africa, post-World War uh, one or post-World War II, we take a look at what the population was when it started and what the population is today, their population has grown at the same rate as the rest of the world. So it wasn't very effective. It was very punitive, but it didn't slow the, pro the population growth of the people of Congo, as they hoped, because they hoped to kill them all. Uh, and then you take a look at the Armenian genocide, which was in late World War I, they hoped to kill all the Armenians. And a lot of them left in the Armenian diaspora, according to one of their, an Armenian website, their population has been slowed by, I think, a factor of 40% versus the rest of the world. So instead of being 6 million, it's 4 million or, or whatever. So you could see this, the effect of the genocide because it slowed the population growth. And you did the same thing with the Holomador, which was what the Russians did in Ukraine when they tried to replace uh, Cossack or Ukrainian farmers with Russian farmers. That sounds familiar. <laughs> That's sort of like a Canadian thing. Um, and so that slowed the Ukrainian population growth to about one third of the world's population growth from the time of the, the start of the whole of the war. So that was the effect. They tried to kill all the Ukrainians and there's fewer Ukrainians. And you do the same thing with the Holocaust. And there were 16 million Jews at the start of the Holocaust in 1930. There's 24 million, according to the Israeli um, statement of the number of people who are eligible to become Israeli citizens today. So that's the constant annual growth rate of like 1% versus, or 0.3% versus 1.2% for the rest of the world. So that slowed the population growth of the Israeli population by three. So that's an effect of genocide. They tried to kill them all and they, they slowed the population. There's a lot less Jewish people than there should be because of the effect of one madman. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the indigenous population and you look at some lower estimates, there were 12 million indigenous, according to Dobbins, in, at contact because no, nothing was discovered. <laughs> this is not the new world. This is the merged world. And it started in Newfoundland. There could have been a, a popular, there could have been a Portuguese guy there before Columbus. It was the Vikings. Portuguese came over from the Azores 20, 30 years before Columbus. Uh, the people, I've confirmed this with other people from the Azores that I've met. Uh, and it's just some, there's not a lot of proof, but it, it makes sense. Um, so there's 12 million, there's 6 million today. So since contact, there's a negative constant annual growth rate that is negative. So the population growth rate of the indigenous people has gone down since contact. And in this merged world, I mean, this was not a merger, this was a takeover. It's not a new world. It was, they were trying to wipe the slate clean. And the effect on different populations has been different because my grandmother was born in 1879, my great grandmother. And she used to tell my mom who recently passed, my mom told me this a year and a half ago that um, her grandmother would tell her not to admit she was native because they hunt natives on the weekends. Now, they actually hunted natives on the weekends in Newfoundland. 
It's not like, <sighs> so Newfoundland, which is the size of England, had no indigenous people who admitted they were indigenous by the 1830s. They killed off all of the off. And so here's my grandmother born 50 years later, and she was told not to admit you're indigenous. And so people in my family, like if I took my grandmother and her sisters and when they were alive and put them on a Six Nations in a card game and a card tournament, like no one would question the fact that they were indigenous. It's just, you know, that's who we are. There's not a damn thing wrong with it. Um, and, but they were taught differently and they were taught to deny their heritage. And that's why a lot of Halapu don't have proof because people would hide it and even in their records. And so that's a different effect. Now, people in Alberta who were contacted in the 16th, 17th, or maybe early 18th century and had to put up with the fort system, they really got the brunt of it by the 1870s, right? With the, res with the residential schools. But we had already had the brunt of it and we, so the Mi'kmaq had learned by the 16th century that the situation was not good. And so what I mean by denying is like, I always knew mom's side of the family, like dad's side of the family came from a Mi'kmaq area. And the names that were in the Mi'kmaq band that were, were our family names. Um, but I, while I was talking to Daniel Paul in 2014 or 2016, he said, yeah, uh, there was a picture in the Globe and Mail which shows one guy or in the National Post. And they said oh, about the 100,000 Newfoundlanders who say that they're indigenous. And that was the picture that I was told was my great, great grandfather. And a guy who was a vice chief in the band said it was his great, great grandfather, which was their brothers. And I talked to Daniel Paul and it was my great grand grandfather's brother or great great grandfather's brother but Daniel said yeah but because uh, Daniel ran the archives he's a noted Mi'kmaq historian who wrote we are not the savages the readers should look it up uh, he's editing it now he's 83 or 84 this year um, but um, so um, he said yeah we're related to my dad was really not a gallant he was a prosper companion he said we're related to the prosperous and uh, so I pulled up Daniel's picture and I pulled up my dad's picture and I superimposed them. <laughs> and I pulled up his brother, Chief Lawrence Paul, and they look more like my dad than my dad's brothers do. And even his half brother who he met most <laughs> more in life, it's just like, I couldn't believe it. I never saw my, my face as indigenous until I put my dad's face with these. And I look like my dad, it's just, um, I, uh, uh, I just had blonder hair. Um, so it, it was interesting, but they were taught not to acknowledge their indigenous heritage. And that's a different effect. So you'd always believe that indigenous people were less. And part of becoming Holopu is just becoming realizing it's not a matter of getting something. It never was. And the racist guys who say that, you know, we're just out for something, just don't understand. It's all about just reclaiming your heritage and admitting, um, coming to terms with who you are and feeling it and, and not feeling it, but um, accepting it and being proud of your heritage. And it's okay. So I apologize for that uh, um, being cut off there. Um, you know, we, we talk so much and I, I honestly probably could listen to you for another hour. Um, what would you like to say to folks to kind of... Uh, conclude what we're the discussion in general well i think in, in with regards to halaku I, I, and the mascots the link is that we want i want to exist in canadian as canada as an equal and i don't know if i can i was always taught that as a newfoundlander i uh people would make jokes and i got to the size that I could discourage them. Um, and I have the mental ability to um, overwhelm people if uh, that is equal to my physical abilities. <laughs> and so as you notice, sometimes I talk too much and get excited and keep going. Um, but it's just about finding a place in Canada where you're equal and treated fairly. Yeah. And 
what I realized is that with mascots being around, it's a reminder that my place in this country and more places as a lesser person than other people. And if I can't just, um, so what I, one of my taglines I used to use is all kids should be able to go to school, a mall, an arena, watch TV or browse the internet without institutionally sanctioned, because that's what the Human Rights Commission Tribunal did, and corporate sponsored hate. And it's a different thing. It's just like you don't have sponsors, like people don't sponsor Triumph of the Will. Like uh, it's not sponsored by Toyota. There's like Triumph of the Will is playing and he's like brought to you by Toyota. It just doesn't happen. No. But yet the Braves and all these guys are on TV and corporate sponsors are there and they're treating it like it's just natural. And the, 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 um, the discrimination and the denial of dignity to other human beings should not be natural. No one has the right to do that. And I think our human rights tribunals and courts have embarrassed themselves. They had six kicks at the can to get this right. I gave them six kicks at the can and, and they just refused. Because ultimately I think it's the, the courts are designed to protect or what it thinks it's doing to protect the country. Mm-hmm. And, and if you allow discrimination to exist in your country, you're not protecting it at all. You're, you're embarrassing it and you are betraying your responsibilities to uphold um, the hopes of a country to be the inclusive like it wants to be. Like yeah. nobody wants this. Nobody mm-hmm. wants nobody wants racism just to be part of natural life. Because sooner or later, it's not you who's going to be the target or it's going to be someone else. And that could be anyone. If the population changes, it could be white people. And so you don't know who's going to be discriminated against. And it's just like everyone should have equal access in Canada to exist and to participate. Now, equal access doesn't mean that everyone is of equal ability, but everyone has, should have the right to participate. Um, and there are so many things that prevent Indigenous people from participating as equal in Canada that um, the mascots are just the biggest symbol. And when they talk about the culture of abuse and the culture of silence around abuse in hockey, you just can't, you can't look any farther than the mascots. I mean, this is just perverse. And even with Trudeau, that's like the one that, look, from what happened to me, that young white girl who stood up, she became a target because anyone who complains in Canada becomes a target. And everyone assumes that if you complain, you're weak. Uh, and so they attack you for complaining. So courage is just take, sitting there and taking it, which is really perverse. Yeah. Um, you're supposed to be encouraged and like, the students who, who came against McGill in 1992 and got them to change the logo, at least. When I, I made a, I opened my documentary with uh, all the mascot fighters that I can think of and all the key ones are in the center. Like um, Richie, uh, Richie Plass, who died last year. When he was in high school, he was asked to be the Indian mascot for a school that was called the Indians. I think uh, he did it for like an hour. And he never felt comfortable at that school again. Um, and so people have those experiences. It's just like, yeah. um, we got to know who's out there. And remember the people who did it, like Susan, uh, you know, um, Charlene Teeters is in the center. Yeah. She stood up against 80,000 people in Illinois. She was protested against the Redskins. These people took some serious abuse. Like I'm there in the little corner on the outside. I didn't take the abuse like that. Um, didn't get physical abuse. I got excluded and ostracized, but I didn't get physical abuse. And I'm too large to do that too. Racists are generally cowards. Yeah. And I did it in a pretty safe place in Mississauga. If I did it in Sudbury, I would have gotten to a scrap because there's less tolerance for negative opinions in Mississauga than there is elsewhere. Um, not just saying Sudbury, but we'll say Red Deer. <laughs> yep. We're in a number of places. Um, but 
it's just like, what do you want for society? Um, I think Indigenous people just want to come and live in Canada. And when somebody said, when they say they're Indigenous, the, um, the response should be cool. That's mm -hmm. it. Shouldn't be, uh, yeah. it shouldn't be people don't have the right to treat them poorly or anything like that. They, people are just, just people. If an Indigenous girl is missing, she goes to the cops and he helps her. He doesn't change the treatment of her missing status because of the basis of who she is, which is the nature of the course. If an Indigenous girl steals a car and she gets stopped, they arrest her. They don't pop two shots in her when she's behind the wheel of a disabled vehicle like Aisha Hudson. They don't kill someone on they don't kill someone on a wellness check like Chantel Moore, and they don't treat people like that. They don't keep Adam Capay or anyone else in solitary confinement. What is it? Six hundred and fifty-seven days. Sixteen hundred and fifty-seven days. So these these basic treatments, and it's like when the school board who says that you're not allowed to swear or you're not allowed to use slurs in schools. So if a kid wore a KKK shirt to my daughter's school, he would have been suspended. But if a kid wears a Blackhawk shirt, that's fine. And so what you're doing is you're treating children differently based upon their ethnicity, based yeah. upon, and their rights are uh, lessened depending on your view of their value. And that's not the way that works. You have a value as a Canadian citizen. Every value is equal. There's no one better. There's no such thing as royalty, right? There's no such thing as I get extra rights because I did this. Yeah. And the people who complain them are as offensive as the people who deny others' rights. Yeah. Um, but so what you have to do is you got to just lay it out and say, what are we doing? How do we be better? Mm. Let's stop the things that we can change. It will be fine if the Blackhawks become the Chicago Boilermakers or whatever else, and they don't mention Indigenous. Indigenous people will be fine if they don't see the green and black and yellow and red on a stupid hockey jersey. It's no big deal. You won't get wooed whenever you go down and you go to a hockey game. You just go sit down and watch the game. And you will just be offended by that fact that no one can afford to play it except for rich white kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just like, it's just like, it's not a game of the people anymore. Yeah. Um, and if you're not protecting Canada by preserving racism, mm -hmm. you're not, you're not upholding, um, you're not upholding pr principles or you're not making you're not honoring the troops who died for Canada in world war one or two or, or wherever else by preserving society that they would not fight for. Because I don't Actually, think- that's a really good point, Brad. Do you, like if today we started renaming things to like, I don't know, Passchendaele or whatever, you know, something of actual significance, like, like that's what I want too. Like I just right. don't want to be a caricature. My, and yeah. I don't want my daughter growing up in a world and on the next generations growing up in a world of caricatures, because we are here, we are real people. We deserve equal treatment. We don't get it in any capacity. Anyway, you and I, I love this conversation so much. I cannot thank you enough for being on here. Um, so I am gonna share your, is there anything else that you would like well, to Well, right share now, um, give me a moment. I have the, like I just signed on with the distributor and I have my film on my website. And I might have some distribution. Uh, like I'm just on an internet service. So I just give me a, a day or so before you share it or a couple of days. Um, but the thing is, what your daughter has to realize is mascots just tells other people that she's less. Yep. And she should never learn to expect that she's less. She's exactly. equal to everyone else. Yep. And so when during, so we, so we're moving, we went down took a look at the community we're moving to and we stopped in Chatham on the way back. And the Shawinigan Cataracts were playing at the restaurant because we were driving all day. We wanted to sit down and they were playing on the TV in front of me at the bar at the casino, I believe in Chatham. You know what I said? I said, uh, can you turn that off? 
first time in eight years, they turned it off. And that's the expectation. It's just like something offends you. Just say, hey, this is not cool. I don't want to see it. I don't want to be abused. It makes me feel bad. And every indigenous kid has the right to do it. Don't expect abuse. Don't tolerate abuse. Don't think that's the standard. Because after I settled with Mississauga, the Redskins were on at Good Life in Mississauga, in Meadowvale. And the manager, who was BIPOC, but he seemed like a nice guy. I said, dude, can you turn off the Redskins game? He's like, you know who I am. You've seen the guys wearing their Indians caps at the gym. And one guy was saying savages as I walked by. And really stupid because he was literally half my size and a third my strength. It's just like, you can't get angry with everyone, though you want to. <laughs> yep. So he'd seen that, and uh, he said, no, we're not changing the channel. And I'm like, but you know, if that was the Uncle Ben's, I'd change the channel for you. And he said, yeah, but I'm not changing it. It's corporate. And it's just this, this good Canadian. They said good Germans, right? In the Holocaust, how do they do these things? Because they're doing what the government told them. Now, the good Canadians I just have to stop. Um, you want to define yourself as a good Canadian, then say, this is what I think. This is what I believe in. This is how I treat people. Yeah. And if you're not doing it, just say, this is not cool. And there has to be more people like, uh, who was it? The, was it Sonnet Insurance? The guys who spoke up against the Eskimos or Quaker Oats or Pepsi? or uh, FedEx, these people have to stand up and say, you know what, this is not cool. Not okay. This is not the society we want. And we just want to, I just want to watch sports. Like when the Guardians played on TV this year and they were just the Guardians, um, the team never changed. The skill of their bench never changed. Nothing else changed. I just felt like I could watch the game and didn't have to turn it off. Yes. Like I do every hockey broadcast when I expect, just expect racism or the omission of racism just to be part of something that disassociates you from the game, that just sure. makes you feel like you don't belong, you were never welcome. And the abuse that they're doing, treating the young girl to is right now, it's just, it's just completely in line with the experiences that I've had. Sure. So I wrote Hockey Canada in 2015 when it got accepted. And I cc it all the sponsors, like uh, the big five sponsors, RBC, or Scotiabank, Canadian Tire, McDonald's, SO, and um, one other. And the guy from Hockey Canada emailed me back, yeah, we're going to get a working group of people we know who are experts in the field, not the, not the psychologists who do the educational analysis, but please stop talking to our sponsors, because if you continue talking to our sponsors, then, you know, uh, we're not going to do it. And it's just uh, money was always first. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just got on too long. The black We've asked <laughs> nicely enough for long enough. So Brad, it's almost getting to the point. We just have to sue them. Well, I did. <laughs> and the courts protected the money. It's so like I, 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 I went after them hard. Yep. I, I just assumed that because I'm not living in there in my band, uh, I'm not going to be the spokesman for my band. And I had a previous human rights experience that I was kind of burned already. Yep. And I said, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to go and go right and kick them where they don't want to be kicked and kick them harder and harder and harder and harder because it doesn't matter. I'm burned anyways. Yep. Uh, and they... Um, was I treated fairly by the human rights court? Watch the documentary and see. <laughs> yeah, fair. Thank you, Brad, so much for that. I so appreciate you coming on, talking okay, about I'm this, because this fight that you're fighting, you're fighting it not just for your, your family, for my daughter, but for everybody. And I, I wish more folks would support you in this journey. I think, uh, you know, we should be supporting each other. Obviously, you'll always get the one native that will be like, no, it's totally fine to be racist. But, you know, if you have the rest of us saying, nope, it's not, then that, and, and I mean, honestly, this is just like common, you know, human rights 101. So it, yeah. it, it is shocking and deplorable to me that Canadians are still like, 
it's just totally okay. I, you know, play golf over dead indigenous bodies and I plow over dead indigenous bodies. And because that's what happened in Red Deer here, what the Red Deer Industrial School, they just yeah. sold the land off and they actually have sold the land off in lots of places across the country. Anyway, and Mississauga Golf and Country you and Club. I could talk first. forever. Thank you so much for coming on. And you're welcome back anytime we can discuss any of this further. I so so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Masi Cho. Masi Cho. Uh, well, I hope people see it and they want to learn more. I hope people get a chance uh, to when I get the, the listing that place to find my documentary, I'll share it with you. And can you please share it with your followers? You bet I will. Okay. And uh, there are things you won't know. Like if a head of an Indigenous Studies department said, hey, hey, I didn't know that, then I would think that there are things that I don't think Canadians know 99% of it. I don't think Indigenous Canadians know 85% of it. Sure. Informed Indigenous Canadians don't know half of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just pe things people have to know because we can be better. Yes. And that's all right? we want. That's all we want. So thank We're, you, Brad. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to encourage people. We have our uh, book clubs coming up. Brad, before I let you go, do you have, a, you, I think you said at least three books to me before we even hit record that you would like other people to read. What are some of your favorite books? Well, the one I read and um, that is Daniel Paul is currently re-editing. Uh, he's, uh, he's an octogenarian now. I think he's doing the fourth edition. His read, We Were Not the Savages. It's the story of the English... Um, occupation of Mi'kmaq lands in the 16th, 17th century. Nice. Uh, because the Mi'kmaq story is a little more drawn out than most other indigenous in North America. Um, it's, uh, along with the Taino, we were the first ones affected. Yep. And perhaps the Beothic were affected before the Taino. Sure. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. Okay. So the next book for our um, book club is uh, August 8th is Reconciled, Unreconciled, sorry, by uh, the National Inquiry. It'll be chapters five and six. Um, Res Rules by chapter seven and eight of the National Fiber and Super Exciliation Action Group. But if you are anywhere across country, like literally there is a committee, whether we're talking a church, whether we're talking a sports club, whether we're talking anything. So there's so much work for Canadians to do. I just cannot understand why they choose not to be racist and side on the side of racism and continue to do absolutely nothing in regards to reconciliation. Um, Brad today spoke a lot of truths, truths that Canada has not talked about, um, certainly aren't teaching in their curriculum. Folks, this is what we need you to be doing if you're not Indigenous. Um, I'm proud that this podcast has given solutions of cultural first aid in all of them to create a safer space for Indigenous to speak. You can go to here to help.bc. If you care about it, that was written by Cheryl Ward, Chelsea Branch, and Alicia Fritkin podcast. I've just had my 200th hour. And if you still do not know what I'm talking about, heard a bit about, uh, internalized racism and lateral violence too. You know, this is a form of violence that racial equity tools.org. You can, if you identify as indigenous black, you're reading more about that so that we're not, uh, you know, I block indigenous people all the time for, um, you know, putting down Jody Wilson rainbow Attack his politics, not his, not him as an individual, my American friends service committee. So AFSC.org. And I mean, Brad and I are telling you don't, and yet here you are. If you see or experience racism and you're in Alberta, you can go to ACT to end racism 73838. Indigenous have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas and reports, commissions, public care, um, many different levels that he tried to work within. No more, honor our platforms, businesses and, and our policies. If they don't recognize um, prevention programs, ed Indigenous education, uterus health, lack of human rights. <laughs> Brad just so eloquently taught us provincially, nationally, it's just continuous action. The recommendation of the World Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the National Inquiry, uh, 200 form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme Canada with multiple reports that say the same thing. Demand change from these, all of this is unprivileged sexism. They literally have zero business doing what they're doing. Uh, this should be understood by everybody. Or to Google how non-Indigenous Canadians is willful to be this ignorant. If you're experiencing emotional distress at Inuit, hope for wellness helpline at one 242 3310. It's open 24 um, on their website at hopeforwellness.ca. If related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, you can call 844-3247 National Call. Almost always a functioning 211 in your area or a distress center line. 
or 4566. Uh, there are one in Alberta is ssisa.ca. And, you know, we have a lot of LGBTQ2+, so you can go to lifevoice.ca. They have a trans lifeline, uh, the Trevor Project. And, you know, I think it's really important to be, we talked to uh, Brad's relation of Indigenous at so many steps of the way here in Alberta, and um, addiction and recovery and criminalizing it and making uh, prison important that we start understanding this is just going to be a new form of institutionalizing people. Um, anyway, if you know somebody who are using alone, there's two apps that you can use. There's the national 888-688-NORS for support S, and that will, it, it gives you somewhat urge you not to use alone. This is important because uh, Alberta has and I don't want another person dying from poor government policy on drugs. This generation has faced it. This podcast is self-care and how I take my power back. That's why I started this podcast without leadership shaming, without gaslighting questions, as many people don't want to hear Indigenous, non-Indigenous opinion all the time. And these are people who don't know anything about protest vigils and our rights. I and many others like Brad have shared info on microaggressions daily, so it's uninformed. Folks like me are dealing with internalized racism, gatekeeping, people who survive off the status quo, folks who are really in their trauma, and just stop people from this everyday reality for me, Indigenous people, folks with disabilities, uh, Q, uh, QT, BIPOC, thank you to my ancestors. Uh, and I know that while many people have their opinions, what matters to attend residential school from the time she was 18 months until the other families have been affected by Indian residential schools. And yet, she's here. And she gives me a strength, or gives me an example of what um, she would never these are people who would know that are proud, proud women and have gone through hell and back and would never admit it. I want to thank my dad's culture through her Austrian roots. Uh, it's through her, I'm a second generation Calgarian. I really appreciate you in every aspect, but you are the producer and editor of this show. You've been my, on my journey of the Red Road. You have witnessed decades of racism and sexism as a result. And to our child, under pipe necklace shows us. You give me daily account of my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that Dalgarian, that you can pledge and support. Thank you, previous donors, for always. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or your questions. I also have a YouTube channel for the latest podcasts and thin posts on social media. And I want to end by giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradition. My, so thank you, folks, for listening to us.